Good afternoon and welcome to Stock Talk. My name is Sean Kabak and I will be your host along with Pam Iwachesco and Aaron Dieterle who will be helping out. Manitoba Agriculture is offering a series of livestock and forage webinars to help Manitoba beef and forage producers. The webinar started in December and will run it monthly until April. We are glad you can join us for today's presentations, which will be recorded so you can view them at a future date. The Stats Canada January 1st inventory survey showed total cattle inventories down 2.2% in Canada to 11.27 million. Beef cow numbers were down 2.5% to 3.56 million from last year. And this is down 181,000 head or 4.8% from the 2018 peak. Essentially, all of the decline occurred in the last two years following the drought. The largest declines were in the Western provinces with Alberta down 4.8%, BC down 2.5 and Saskatchewan down 1.8. Then the other provinces saw some growth, Ontario up 2.9%, Quebec up 2.3%, Atlantic Province is up 1.2, and Manitoba had a growth of 0.6%, which is uh, positive and good to see. So last month on Stock Talk, we had two great marketing presentations, one from Rick Wright, who gave us a cattle market update and outlook, and another one on prepping calves for sale by Alan Monroe of the Killarney Auction Mart. If you missed these presentations, you can go back and watch the recording. A sure sign of spring, <clears throat> as March is one of the busiest times for calving, is when calving season starts and newborn calves start hit, hitting the ground. Another sign is when all the bull sale catalogs start showing up in the mail in, in our mailboxes. So there have already been a few bull sales held with more to come. To help you know if and when you need to replace any of your bulls, we will have a bull soundness evaluation presentation from Deanne Wilkinson, who is Manitoba Ag's extension vet. And I would like to welcome Deanne for her presentation. Thanks, Sean. Um, so, Sean did um, introduce me as the extension veterinarian. Um, I graduated from the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in 2012, uh, worked in mixed animal practice for almost a decade and then started with Manitoba Agriculture in 2021. Um, most of my experience is uh, with beef practices, with beef practice. Um, and so, Bull breeding soundness evaluations are kind of one of my more favorite things to do. So I was really excited when I got invited to, to do this chat. Um, so I will just dive into it because there isn't a lot of time. Um, just going to try get rid of. There we go. Um, so yeah, um, bull breeding soundness evaluations not just a way of vets are trying to make money, they're actually quite important. Um, so um, I just wanted to start with a little outline of what I was gonna be covering. Um, I'm gonna go over the nuts and bolts of bull breeding soundness evaluations, starting with their importance. Um, and then I'll go over the different sections of the evaluation. Um, and as I go through each section, I'll probably, I'll point out areas of abnormality um, that are more commonly encountered. So bull breeding soundness evaluations or bull BSEs, um, their aim is to catch reproductive concerns um, before that bull goes out and either doesn't breed or actually ties up a cycle or more. Um, the reason they're so important, bulls are a huge investment. Um, it's costly to feed an animal that's not contributing to the operation. So if we're culling open cows, that's one animal contributing to one calf. We really need to be assessing the abilities of the bull because they're contributing to 20 or more calves per season. Um, they also contribute 50% of the genetics for your calf crop. So some of these um, reproductive abnormalities have some genetic basis to them um, and you don't want to be passing those on in your herds um, unless you don't keep replacements and you're not purebred or seed stock then, then they're maybe not quite as uh, big an issue. Um, reproductive success is just essential to the productivity of your operation. So the BSC itself doesn't, um, it does its best to assess the bull's abilities, but it's not a complete guarantee. It's just a snapshot at one point in time and things can change quickly. Um, there's many variables from injury and disease during um, breeding season to a lack of actual libido. And these factors mean that producers still have to keep an eye on their herd to watch for cows returning to cycle um, or the bulls 
abilities to breed. Um, and it's already also really informative to keep your BSE records from year to year. Um, that way you can see trends. Um, you can, it might warrant culling a bull if he's progressively getting worse, or you might know that at the end of this breeding season, you don't want to feed that bull for another winter and you can get rid of them before those costs are incurred. Um, so we looked at the why of the breeding soundness evaluation. Then we, now we can look at the when they're done pre-show and sale. Um, before semen collection for AI purposes. They'll be done during the breeding season if a producer has um, reproductive soundness um, concerns with their bull. And then they're also done pre-breeding. Um, it's probably a good idea to choose uh, to do your um, pre-breeding evaluations relatively close to when you're breeding because a lot can happen between um, evaluation time and the breeding season. Um, you do have to balance it though with knowing what you have in your bull battery before the, before the sale season hits or else you might be left with uh, no available bulls if you have a few not passing. Um, it's also not a bad idea to be rechecking those um, new bulls you bought if the sale is months in advance of when your breeding season is. Um, and the last thing I do like to, to point out is that bulls can be really hard to collect in evaluations if they've been out breeding females. Um, I like to ask producers to pull their bulls for three or four days prior to testing them or else we may not collect a sample. Um, so most vets in Western Canada use the WCABP breeding soundness evaluation form. Um, it's a standard form, there's electronic ones now if you're fancy, and it's put together by the Western Canadian Bovine Practitioners Association. They're an excellent standard, they cover the basics, um, the back of the form has information for producers on things like breed minimums for scrotal circumference, um, and then it has all the different parts. I'll just mention them briefly and then go into them more detail on the next slides. So we have our owner and animal identification at the top then it's mating abilities and sex drive, followed by physical soundness and scrotal circumference. Um, and then into the semen quality um, section, followed by the actual classification of the bull. And there's area for comments um, throughout the form. So where, where are we doing these evaluations? On farm or in clinic, depending on your facilities and how many you're doing. Um, you need to have a sturdy shooter alley system because bulls are big and they'll break everything they can try. Um, it doesn't have to be a fancy shoot by any means and you don't always actually want to catch their head. You do need to be able to place a pole behind them though so they can't move far. Um, the most ideal is when your shoot's long enough that you can catch the bull without catching their head and still place a pole behind them. Then the vet can still get behind the bull through the palpation cage because climbing the fence every time to um, to put the probe in when you're testing them isn't exactly fun. Um, then the vet does need a warmish place to assess the semen sample. Um, something warmer than what I'm doing on the truck box here is better. Um, motility of the semen decreases dramatically when it's cold. So lots of vets have their own utility trailers where they do this. Lots of producers will have a warm shed nearby. And my personal preference is uh, testing bowls on a nice warm June afternoon because then you don't have to worry about any of that. So the bull BSC, um, mating abilities is usually left to the producer, um, often it's checked off as a no one unless the producer actually has viewed um, and has any remarks to, to tell the vet. Um, so this is an area where producers really do still need to be watching their cows to see if they're returning to cycle, see if that bull is actually following and mounting females properly. Um, because if they do not have the desire or mount in an abnormal fashion and aren't actually aren't actually breeding the females they're pretty useless and that's that's a deal breaker um, then with the physical soundness it starts off with body condition score um, that's usually a five point scale and i'm usually hoping for a two and a half to sort of three and a half out of five um, lots of saleables just to reach sale weight are a little on the stuffed side which isn't ideal um, you know, just from the aspect of those heavy concentrate diets can cause ruminal acidosis, um, liver abscesses, which I don't think producers realize how common they are in the packing plants, see the, all those results. Um, so it's just something that I'm always thinking about. Those really heavy bulls too, they're depositing fat in their scrotum, which can overheat the testicles. Um, 
can cause laminitic changes in the feet. And those bulls just don't move properly. So they're gonna have troubles if they're actually having to breed on pasture. And lots of producers uh, know to make comments about how their bulls are melting in the summer because they just, they weren't ready for the diet change and they were really overfed in the beginning. And then we have the opposite end of the spectrum too, where lots of people don't spoil their bulls over the winter and they get a little, a little too lean. If those bulls are trying to catch up in terms of body condition um, throughout the summer, their semen quality just might not be there and it's not reasonable to expect them to, to live up to their potential. So the table just has uh, the different areas that uh, we're looking for. So we're looking at their eyes, make sure we don't see big scars, injuries, um, cancer eye or squamous cell carcinoma. You know, it's not often we have bulls right in the shoot. So it's a great time to look at all these areas. For feet, I'm looking for solid sound feet. Um, I'm watching for long toes, laminitic changes, corns, sand cracks. A curling claw can sometimes be genetic. So that's something I like to point out if I see it. Um, depending on the severity of the issue, sometimes you just point it out to the producer and they know to watch for sand cracks in the summer or just maybe keep a special eye on them because he might be more prone to lameness. Um, but some things are, are a deal breaker if they're really unsound. The legs, we're also looking for good conformation so they can stand up to the strain of mounting. The accessory sex glands, we're assessing when we're palpating the bowl just before we put the probe in. So we're feeling for their bubble urethral gland, seminal vesicles, ampulla, and prostate gland. Um, and we're basically feeling for anything that looks sort of large, abscessed, or if you feel a, a lack of it, it can mean that there's, there's some big abnormalities. The more common issue we see is uh, seminal vesiculitis, which is an infection in them. So there's two uh, paired glands there. So you're kind of comparing each side. If one feels larger and really firm, you might really be looking at that, uh, at your semen evaluation to see if you're looking for white blood cells. Um, with vesiculitis, uh, it's pretty hard to treat uh, if they're older bulls. Bulls under two, we can give uh, Draxin or Tolathromycin, um, any of those macrolide antibiotics, and they can clear up, um, but it may take some time for them to fully recover. We're feeling the inguinal rings just to make sure we don't feel any inguinal hernias, because uh, th that can be heritable and a very serious issue. Um, as we're doing the evaluation, we're looking at the penis for warts because um, they can be removed, but you want to remove them uh, quite in advance of breeding season. There also can be a persistent frenulum, which is just a piece of tissue sort of connecting and pulling the tip of the penis back. It's easily cut, but it is genetic. So, um, you know, if you're a seed stock producer, you might not want to keep those bulls in your program. Um, we're watching for the, the injuries for the prep use, the scrotum, usually kind of the main thing I'm looking for is evidence of frostbite. Um, you want the testicles to move freely within the scrotum because that means the bull can thermoregulate those testicles properly. Um, and you want the testicles themselves to be firm, not rock hard. If they're feeling softer, um, and don't fill the scrotum normally, you might be thinking of some issues like degeneration and you don't want them twisted either because that can interfere with uh, normal sperm movement. The epididymis is sort of the last thing I'm feeling for. Um, there's a little, uh, it's a has three parts to it. So the head, the body, and the tail of the epididymis, and it sort of sits on the outside of the testicle itself. Um, and the tail is sitting at the bottom of the testicle. So that's some place that we often will, more often will find an infection there if it's too firm and those bowls usually aren't collecting very well. So a picture of frostbite. Um, good bedding is sort of important in Manitoba, but sometimes the weather will do, which just work against you depending on the storms. Um, and some bowls will find every manure pile to lay in and everyone else will be frostbite free and they will still have it. Um, so with frostbite, we're looking for testicles that move freely within the scrotum. If they scar down to the scrotum, that means they can't thermoregulate. Um, usually depending on the severity of the frostbite, um, you may actually see abnormalities in the sperm morphology and motility. Um, if it wasn't super severe frostbite, it's time that we're waiting for for those um, 
the healing to occur and new sperm to be made and, and be normal. Um, the sperm cycle itself takes 60 days, and I like to recheck voles every, no more frequently than every three weeks, and you'll start seeing um, a new set of sperm coming through. And as long as you're seeing improvements, it, that's a good sign that bull is coming back. Um, I did have one bull where his testicles were scarred to a scrotum. He was ready to be shipped, but I checked him a month later because other bulls were coming through and the scar had broken down and his morphology had increased by like 40%. So sometimes it's worth giving them a second chance. Then with the scrotal circumference, we measure in centimeters. Um, I was extremely lucky, lucky and was taught by the bull guru in Saskatoon, Dr. Barth. He designed this reliable tape, um, which is a great tool even for um, purebred breeders to be using. Um, so bulls measurements should be at or above the minimum established values for their breed at their specific age. Um, they're considered questionable or unsatisfactory if they don't meet the breed minimum. Usually that means they have some fertility issues too. Um, occasionally we can have small scrotal circumference bulls collect totally normally, but um, they're, they're still considered questionable in that case. And scrotal circumference is an indicator of fertility. So daughters from sires with below minimum scrotal circumferences will take longer to reach sexual maturity. So if you keep uh, retain replacement females, you do not want to be having bulls that have small scrotals. Um, very large values are also not good. They can indicate injury, scarring, or fat being laid around the scrotum. Um, scrotal measurements increase. Um, as they're aging and then they sort of plateau and increase at a smaller rate. So from 11 to 12 months, they're increasing by about one and a half centimeters per month. And then from 13 to 14 months, they're only increasing by about 0.8 of a centimeter. Um, so some examples of minimums for Angus or Semitol, 12 month old bull, 32 centimeters is minimum. Um, but for a 12 month old Hereford bull, 31 centimeters is minimum. So when you're measuring them, um, you want to pull the testicle down into the scrotum as far as they'll go. You place the tape across the widest part of the testicles and you, it has a spring-loaded button and you push the button until it reaches the uh, intersection between the red and the green. So this really tries to remove variation between vets um, because we should all be applying the same amount of pressure. Um, and it is very repeatable. Um, so it's a really nice tool and it's something that purebred breeders can be using just to assess their, your, their bulls as they're growing older, just so they have an idea if someone looks small, they can actually go and measure them. So looking at semen quality itself, we're collecting usually with electro ejaculation. Um, I was taught that you actually get a better sample with uh, electro ejaculation versus massage. Um, now we're, we indicate if they protrude or not. Um, some practitioners will actually grasp the penis as they protrude so that they can assess it. And um, there is the occasional bull that won't protrude just because they didn't like how the test was feeling. Um, and those ones I'll always try to write down on the evaluation that owners should watch um, to ensure that they protrude properly when they're in a breeding situation. Because there are times sometimes where there could be scarring or a congenitally short penis, and they can't actually enter the female, so they're not actually breeding anything. With the volume of sample, more isn't always better. Bulls can have a rusty load where they'll have a really large volume and lots of it will be dead. Sometimes they need to be cleaned out, but sometimes they do have something else going on. Um, so I usually just collect enough uh, volume, a few mils, so that you have enough to stay warm while you're, you're examining it. We're looking at the density, so that's how thick it is. Creamy is better. Um, if it gets to be sort of milky and watery, um, we're probably not getting a great sample. Sometimes that's more um, because the bull just wasn't his day. Um, sometimes it's, uh, um, we were collecting it a little too early or a little too late. So we don't actually uh, pass or fail a bull based on the density. Now we do look at gross motility, which is looking at the swirling um, under really low power. So we want to see a thick sample swirling a lot. Um, and then we go down to um, higher power and we look at the individual sperm. Um, and that's called individual motility. 
Um, so with individual motility, we want to see at least 60% of the sperm swimming straight across the screen. Um, it's no good if they're swimming in circles because that means that there are some abnormalities and they are, may not breed. Um, so that is one of the parts uh, that they need to pass a test. Um, then we look at staining alive. So with our stain, when we're making the slides, um, dead sperm show up as pink and live will be white. And they have to have at least 60% uh, to be alive. Um, usually we can eyeball that because it's, it's either it looks good or it doesn't look good at all. And then we look at the actual morphology, which is kind of fun. So they need to have at least 70% normal sperm in terms of morphology. Some of the common defects we see are proximal droplets. So that's a little circle that's right at the base of the head and we see it often in immature bulls. They don't move properly and they won't fertilize the egg. And then we have the distal mid-piece reflexus or DMR, it's really common. Uh, it can be seasonal, so we can see it a little bit more in Angus bulls in winter season. Um, their individual motility won't be very good because they're swimming in circles. Um, so, if you have poor uh, motility, you might see these DMRs a bit more. And then we look for head and nuclear issues. Uh, nuclear defects are in the head are a lot more of an issue because they can actually swim up to the egg, bind to the egg, start that zona re reaction, and then they'll block other sperm from fertilizing that egg. But because they're abnormal, they're not actually gonna create an embryo. Um, so they basically have ruined a whole cycle for that cow. Um, the acrosome issues, so a knobbed acrosome is a flat top to the head. It won't cause this zona reaction, so it's not as big a deal, but it, if there's lots of them, it will decrease fertility. Um, and yeah, when we have tail and mid-piece problems, those sperm just start swimming straight, and they'll usually get filtered out at different places in the female. So in my picture, a normal sperm I've sort of labeled here with the head, um, it has a nice round shape to the head. The sort of neck of it isn't super narrow. Um, then the mid pieces are sort of the first part of the tail. The principal piece is late further on and the end piece is the very end. Um, the black arrow is pointing to one that has a completely coiled up tail and that's called a DAG defect. Um, we can see it sometimes if just, you know, there's frostbite or something, if there's lots of them, then it might be genetic. Um, so the black arrow in this picture, it's the DMR, so the distal mid-piece reflexus. So it's just bent right back on itself and he's gonna swim in circles if he's even swimming. The blue arrow is a proximal droplet. So we'll see those in immature bulls um, lots of times around that 12 month age. And it just means that they're just not mature. We can also see it with things like frostbite too. Um, and you can notice that there's white circles uh, in other places along the slide. Those are droplets that actually fell off other, other sperm. So it's kind of interesting when you can see them and they're actually still attached to the sperm. Um, the purple arrow is just showing you a dead sperm. He's pink. <clears throat> and we're not actually doing morphology on them because they're already dead. So to be satisfactory, um, we need, if the owner has observed mating problems, then that, or the bull should have not been observed to have mating abnormalities. Um, he needs to be physically sound and have a minimum scrotal circumference and his semen must have good viability. So 60% or more have to be moving straight ahead and be motile and be staining alive. And at least 70% have to have normal morphology. So our other classifications are decision deferred. Usually we reserve that for immature bulls that don't meet the satisfactory classification, but their defects are probably due to age. And then we recommend retesting them in a month or so. Questionable is if they do not meet minimums, um, but they possibly may retest. So if a bull is below minimum scrotal but has good semen quality, we may say questionable, like he's not technically a pass, but he's not a full-on fail. Um, if we have confirmation abnormalities, we might put them as questionable too. So these guys are not fit for sale. Um, they may be if they pass later on. Um, if it's a producer's own animal, you have to 
use this depending on your situation. So if you have multiple sire groups, um, they're not a boss bull, um, you know, and they're a 60% morphology, then they might be reasonable to use just sort of as a backup. Um, but it, it just depends on your situation. Um, unsatisfactory means they do not meet the minimums. Um, so if we notice significant issues like lots of head defects where they could really ruin a cycle, um, he's not collecting well, we notice some infections and in epididymitis or anything like that. And if he's been retested a few times and hasn't uh, passed it at all, then we'll probably put him as unsatisfactory. I will do a very quick side note that it's a great time to vaccinate your bulls when they're in the shoot, uh, when you're testing them. Um, so you would just want to use a core viral every year and a core clostridial at least every other year. So that covers for your bovine viral diarrhea, bovine herpes virus, parainfluenza 3, and bovine respiratory syncytial virus. Um, and then some producers might add in foot rod or pink eye, just depending on what their situation is like. So just in summary, there are a lot of variables when it comes to bulls reproductive abilities. Things can change in an instant, um, and the BSC is just a snapshot in time. But it does provide the information um, as to whether they have the ability to make offspring, and it can minimize the risk by detecting some issues before they go out to breed. Um, it is really challenging. Bulls are in sales as 13 and 14 month olds, so they're being tested when they're around 12 months. Um, there is very little value in trying to test bulls that are less than 12 months old. Um, previous research has shown that only 60% of 12 month old bulls really should be passing um, their semen evaluations. That may have changed a little bit with genetic selection, but um, sometimes there is a concern that some yearling evaluations are not quite stringent enough. So we have to keep those things in mind. Um, and it's challenging because bull sale season runs before most commercial guys have tested their bulls. So some producers are guessing on how many bulls they're gonna need for the season. Um, and it can be a really long time from when sale bulls are tested until they're actually out and breeding. So sometimes you should be thinking about retesting those bulls to ensure they're still okay. Um, tests have to be approached in a practical manner. Um, you know, when they're conducted for an own producer's own bulls, sometimes some of those questionable bulls will be okay to keep, um, but for, for sale, they definitely aren't, aren't adequate. Um, so that is all I have today. Um, questions, comments? Thanks, Deanne. I guess one of the questions I had of the bulls that are evaluated, say on farm that are already in the individual's bull battery, what percent usually wouldn't pass? Mm, not a lot. Um, it depends if they have a few more older bulls, but I wouldn't see 10, 20% maximum. Um, I haven't seen any giant wrecks or, and usually producers aren't surprised when it's an older bull or something. So, um, but it, yeah, it really does depend. We've had some winters where some of those frostbite and wind situations have really wreaked havoc on things. Thanks. That was kind of my next question is, so age is a factor. I mean, severe wind chill or extremely cold weather. Are there any other kind of big factors where might encourage a producer, I need to check my bulls because of this, this happened? Um, I guess if you notice that, um, that they're looking different, like sometimes bulls will actually lose their sort of their hump to their neck. Um, you might even notice their scrotal size being smaller because um, sometimes we can see those two-year-old bulls, uh, you used them for a season, sometimes they'll degenerate. I don't have a good explanation for why, but if they just don't, if they don't look like the other bulls in the pen, I definitely would, would worry about them. Right, and I mean that frostbite picture that you showed was was pretty yeah. obvious. And so, yeah. it, uh, and that bull, he's frostbitten every year, and he always eventually passes by July. <laughs> he just likes he likes laying on the cold packs or. Uh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> uh, Pam, 
do you have any questions from participants? I guess I should have mentioned earlier, if uh, participants have any questions, you can type them in to the, um, on the screen under Q and A, so. Just a question with regard to retesting, um, what percentage would you say that, you know, passes or fails either or with regards to having to retest afterwards? Like is, if they've failed, really badly on the first test? Is it worthwhile to wait and retest? And, and how long would that process be? Usually I'm waiting at least three weeks to retest because you'll start to see some improvements if they're going to be. It really depends on the issue they're having. Um, like uh, the bulls that I've seen with epididymitis, I just can't even collect a sample and there is no sample to collect. Um, but I would always give them a second chance um, because uh, just because you never know sometimes if it wasn't their day when you were collecting them the first time, I, I would never wanna lop someone's head off because of one test. Um, I guess they're the only frostbite I've ever seen where I think the bull almost sloughed everything that we did actually test him again and he didn't pass, but um, Usually, it, yeah, it really depends on the issue. Um, if a bull, it's almost probably like 50-50. If you don't really know what's going on and they're giving you a, a bad sample, probably half of them get better, half don't, but that's, it just is very individualized, so. So you're basically saying to, to do, like to basically wait out the retest and, and, and then I make would. a decision. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Once I've done a second test, then you have an idea of, there's any progression is it getting better is it getting worse um and if anything else feels abnormal in them um but yeah i usually like to give them that one chance and you had mentioned the sperm cycle is 60 days does the test mm -hmm. itself, if you're performing does that affect the quality of the bull sperm afterwards? Not, not that i know of no it's They'd probably be doing that in the pen themselves anyways just it's like collecting a sample for them um yeah okay no that's kind of whether it was yep. an old old myth that was out there before that there was a stress caused by the bse that's being done but uh, it's good i have never encountered that but that's it for questions sean all right, well, thank you, Deanne, for that informative presentation. And if producers would like to contact Deanne uh, directly, that's her contact information on the screen. So feel free to, to give Deanne a call or send her a, an email or a text. So, so thank you, Deanne. So now that you know if you need to upgrade or replace some of your bulls, you have to decide on what are you going to buy because your herd sires represent 50% of your genetics. Selecting your next bull is an important decision to make genetic improvements in your herd. So to help you to make that decision easier and to provide some bull buying and selection tips, we have Andrea Berthelay, who's a Mantabag Livestock and Forest Specialist in the Clarny office. So I'd like to welcome Andrea. All right, sorry about that. Just trying to find my mute button. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Sorry about that little pause. Um, so yes, my name is Andrea Berthley and I work out of the Clarny office as a livestock and forage extension specialist. I also farm uh, with my partner and his family. Uh, we run about 350 cow-calf pairs, um, purebred and commercial. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, bull selection and bull buying tips as tis the season. Uh, bull sales in Manitoba have been ramping up this past couple weeks um, and throughout March there is just about a bull sale <laughs> every day um, and I'm sure your mailbox looks very similar to ours and that sampling of that picture is just <laughs> a small sampling of the stack of bull sale catalogs that um, we get and I'm sure I'm sure most of you do as well. Uh, so uh, this afternoon I'm just going to 
do a quick talk about some things to consider when you are looking to replace a herd sire by a new herd sire. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to touch on is some record keeping, um, things that you can keep track of to help you make the best decision for your operation. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about heritability of certain traits, uh, as well as confirmation, so soundness, phenotype, genotype, uh, and then I'll touch on EPDs and actual performance data and how they all work and how to interpret that data. Uh, touch on confidence in the program you're buying from and then just a few take home notes uh, to follow up at the end. So as Deanne mentioned, it's funny she had said that and Sean as well, because that was one of the first slides I put together was buying a herd sire is a big decision as that makes up 50% of the genetic makeup of your herd. Um, and especially important if you are retaining uh, replacement females uh, from your own herd. If you purchase females and all of your calf crop is uh, terminal crosses that get marketed, uh, then this, this maybe isn't as important, but it still makes up 50% of the genetics of those progeny that you are selling. Um, so it is a big decision uh, make, picking your herd sire. So how do you make that decision? Uh, there are tools and things that you can do and keep track of throughout the year uh, to help you make better decisions. Um, so do you know which bulls sire which calves. I know in a lot of situations when breeding on pasture, if you have large pastures, you have to run more than uh, one bull with, with a certain set of cows. Um, so being able to tell which, which bulls sire which calves and how they perform. So it, are you really liking the calves off that bull? Are you not really liking what isn't it that you're liking? Are they weighing up at weaning weight? Are they too big at calving? Um, you know, those types of things, being able to keep track and know exactly which calves come off of which bulls can really help you make better decisions um, in bull selection. Um, how do you record those things? So, but keeping track of them, um, is it just something in general that you keep track in your head? Um, as my dad always called it, it's in my computer. My computer is in my head and I, I know what those ones did. Um, yeah, you may have an idea, but until it's actually recorded and written down, um, it's an assumption. Uh, so sometimes you can see different trends when it's actually um, a written record. Um, now there is in the electronic age that we are in, um, there are some databases and electronic tracking um, apps or systems that you can use to track uh, performance of your herd. So calving, electronic calving books, um, weaning weight performance, all that sort of stuff that you can track um, in those databases. Um, but also, you know, just having a good old calving book um, and keeping track of of those types of things and, and ultimately coming down to knowing uh, what bulls sire which calves and being able to go back and look and see what the, how those calves did at birth, at weaning, um, and then at marketing. If you background some calves, how did they do during the backgrounding phase um, and all those sorts of things, being able to actually regularly weigh your, your animals um, and then track that information as well. So that kind of leads me to another thing is, you know, birth weight, are your calves big or small? Um, but are you actually weighing them? Do you know what they are actually weighing? Um, if you think your calves are um, really big uh, and you weigh them and they're really 85 pounds or something like that, or vice versa, they're too small, but they're, you know, you know do you know where you're at ultimately is what it comes down to. And then same with weaning weight, um, run those calves across the scale. If you can get an idea of where they are and keep track of that. Um, and then, you know, on to the next phase of backgrounding or feeding them, um, especially if you're, you know, when it comes to just the management of those, those groups um, to know how they're weighing up, what their gains are like, um, and then leading that back, tying that back to the genetics of where they come from and being able to make the best genetic decisions to get the performance that you want to see out of your calves. So then, you know, keeping track of all this data, looking at what you've got and are you where you want to be? Uh, what, are, what are your goals? Um, so the first step in setting your goals and knowing you need to know where you're at and where do you want to be and then how can you get there um, so being record keeping is is so important and i think it's something that we we need to to put some more thought into and our computers in our head may not keep track of everything uh, that we need to uh, so finding a way to to keep good records and being able to look back and assess those records um, can help you meet your goals faster um, and when you're determining what your goals are and what you're looking for in a herd sire, um, you know, determining whether 
are all, is your entire calf crop terminal? So are they all being shipped off the market or do you keep replacement heifers? So do you want a certain herd sire? Do you wanna keep daughters off a certain herd sire um, if you're planning to keep those heifers uh, versus market heifers? Um, so taking a look at those different traits and attributes um, when you're selecting your herd sire. Uh, and as Deanne talked about, um, know where you stand. Uh, with your herd bulls before bull sale season. Uh, so do an assessment because um, bull sale season is kind of a short, quick whirlwind and a lot of producers don't need a bull till July, June or July, um, but there's no bull sales around that time or right close to that time. So um, having an idea of what you need and what you're looking for um, ahead of your breeding season uh, will, will help you out. And have having herd bull semen tested um, early to have an idea if there is any major issues. Um, I've had this meme or little cartoon for a long time and it makes me laugh every time I see it. So management of your herd bulls is important um, as well. Just because he bred last year doesn't mean he's gonna be able to breed this year. Um, and I know during the winter months, you don't need your bulls. You don't really think about your bulls. They sometimes get you know thrown out in the back 40 and, and not managed or looked at um, nearly as much, but it is really important to make sure your bulls have um, adequate nutrition throughout the winter and adequate bedding to protect um, from frostbite of those testicles and that sort of thing as well to ensure um, breeding soundness come breeding season. Uh, there is also a little tool on the BCRC, so the Beef Cattle Research Council. Um, has a bull valuation calculator. Um, I've got the link up at the top of the screen there as well. Um, so this is a quick calculator that can help you determine because what um, what you could afford to pay for a herd bull. Um, bulls, bull, buying a bull is a big investment um, and it's a big investment cost wise and it's a big investment genetic wise. Um, so being able to put some numbers to it and think um, to know what you could spend on a bull um, can help you make that decision um, as well. Because if you put all the numbers in here of what your calf crop is, what you wean your calves are, what you get for your calves, you might actually be able to spend a little more on a bull than you think you might. Um, once you go through and do, do this evaluation, you could be able to maybe be able to access some um, top end genetics by spending a little more money um, and be able to reach those goals a little quicker as well. So on the BCRC website, um, there is this calculator. So you can just do it right on the website, just like you see on the screen here, or at the bottom, you can actually download an Excel spreadsheet and you can input your own numbers um, and play around with it a little bit more as well. Um, on the website, you can change some of the numbers, um, anything that's in yellow, um, you, can, you can adjust those numbers and it'll do the calculation for you. Um, so yeah, take a look at that calculator and you can play around with it and it can it's it's a tool that can help you determine um, where your budget might be. Uh, so now I've kind of talked a bit about the decision making the tools, um, you know, make you setting your goals, what it is that you're looking for and the impact that a bull can have. Um, when you're looking at the different traits and, you know, determining which traits it is that you're looking to add to your herd. Um, keep in mind the heritability. So heritability varies greatly between different traits. So typically your reproductive traits, so your calving interfertility, interval fertility, longevity, maternal ability, um, those are relatively low heritabilities. Whereas you go to the other end of the spectrum, your moderate to high heritabilities are your carcass traits. So your marbling ability, your ribeye area, so size of the ribeye, um, your frame score. So your overall size, frame size of the animal is a fairly highly heritable. So if you're thinking your cow, you're retaining heifers, your cows or your calves are, are getting too small, too moderate framed uh, for what the market is, um, and you're wanting to add a bit more frame, frame score, uh, buying a bigger frame bull is something that is fairly highly heritable and you will see in the calf crop. Um, same as mature weight kind of goes along with that frame score. And then your moderately heritable traits are your milk production, uh, feed efficiency growth, so your birth weight, your weaning weight, average daily gain, that sort of thing, um, are your moderately heritable traits. So when looking at a bull to select, uh, confirmation is one of the most important things to look at. There's 
you know, structural soundness leads to longevity. So if you're investing, um, you know, six, $7,000 or more on a bull, then you want to make sure you get five, six, seven, eight years of use out of him. Um, so take a good look at structural soundness, um, feet and legs set, um, the, the proper angle of their hoof, um, the hoof itself. Um, you want that nice um, kind of square toe. You don't want them long and narrow. You want that nice square um, hoof. Um, and then the correct set to their legs, um, you know, kind of a fairly, a little bit of set to their legs, not poker straight and not stickle hocked or um, set extra set to their legs, um, that good soundness. And then from behind, you want to make sure that they're nice, fairly straight and keep those back legs right, right underneath them. Um, they're not bow legged or cow hawk where they stick them out to the side um, and watch those bulls move, um, get them out. I know lots of times when you're at a bull sale, they're in a lot of straw. It's hard to see them. Um, take that effort to get those bulls out in the alley or something like that. If where there is possible and take a good close look at how they move up and down the alley. Do they track that back foot should step right in the front foot's track or very close to it? Um, you know, taking taking the time to assess the soundness of, of bulls will go a long way um, in, in the longevity of, of the bull. Uh, phenotype versus genotype. Uh, so phenotype is the trait or the characteristic that you physically see in the animal that the animal physically displays. Uh, genotype is the genetic makeup of that animal. So your phenotype is your genetics plus the environmental impact, and that's what you see. Uh, so your genotype is the genetics behind the physical look of the animal. And there is a lot of genetic um, Analysis these days too. So there's a lot of the breed associations do a lot of genetic evaluation um, for the for different traits, um, as well as um, genetic abnormalities and that sort of thing. Um, so some of the more common genetic testing that you will see um, would be coat color. Uh, so if you've got a black animal, um, they can either be heterozygous black or homozygous black. Now, what does that mean? I know a lot of sale catalogs and things you will see, homo black or heterozygous black. So here's a bit of a picture that shows what, what that means. Um, so homozygous black, so in the top left-hand corner, you've got a homozygous black sire and a homozygous black down. All of the progeny from them will be black. So if you buy a homozygous black bull, no matter whether you breed it to red or black cows, they're gonna have black calves. Um, now, if you, and so the both across the top are homozygous black bull. Um, so some, even on the red, the black cows that are heterozygous, you'll still get all black calves, but some of them will be a red carrier. So then down the road, if those red carriers were bred to a heterozygous bull, you could get um, some red calves. And then the bottom two are, depicting using a heterozygous black bull. So you buy a black bull that's heterozygous. So that means he is a red carrier. He is black himself, but he has is a carrier of the red gene. Um, so breeding heterozygous to heterozygous, you will get three quarters of the progeny would be black, 50% would, and then 25% would be red. And then 50% would be red carriers. So you'd get 25% homozygous black, 50% black, but red carriers, and then 25% red. And then using a heterozygous black animal on a red cow, you would get 50% black, but they would be red carriers and 50% red cows. So that can help you kind of determine what, whether homozygous or heterozygous black, um, what if, if, you know, consistently black calves is important to you, having that consistent coat color in your calf crop, then a homozygous black bull would be, would be the sure bet for you. Um, and that can help you make that, that decision. The other genetic test that um, you will see a lot of is the pole gene. So um, you can buy their, a bull can either be, if they're a polled bull, they will either be homozygous polled or heterozygous polled. So there's two pole genes. Um, there are two, two genes that affect horned or pole. Um, 
So if you across the top, you're using a pulled bull, um, a homozygous pulled bull. So if you use a homozygous pulled bull on a horned cow, you will get all pulled calves. Um, but those pulled calves will be heterozygous. So they will still carry the horn gene, but then themselves will be pulled. If you use a homozygous pulled sire on heterozygous pulled cows, um, so you have pulled cows, but there's a potential that there's a horn gene in there somewhere. Um, you will get half of them will be homozygous pulled and half of them will be heterozygous pulled. And then the bottom two pictures show buying a heterozygous pulled bull. So that is a bull that is pulled himself. He does not have horns, but the, his progeny, but he carries the horn gene. Um, so on the bottom left, if you breed a heterozygous to a horned cow, uh, you'll get half pulled, half horned. If you, then the right one, if you breed that heterozygous pulled bull to a uh, pulled, heterozygous pulled, female, you will get 25% will be homozygous pulled, 50% will be heterozygous pulled, so pulled but carry the horn gene, and then 25% will have horns themselves. So I know this is one that um, we get asked a lot about, uh, what does the heterozygous homozygous pulled mean and what's that mean for my calves? So it really depends on the cow, your cow herd, and how much of an influence, whether you have homozygous or heterozygous horn pulled females in your herd. Um, but this, I, I really like these images and I think it gives you a good idea um, of, of what you could expect. It's a predictor of what to expect in the progeny from. So next thing I'm going to talk about is EPDs. Uh, so EPDs are expected progeny differences. Um, so they predict the expected performance of that animal. Um, when looking at EPDs, compare, you can use them to compare to others within that breed. You cannot compare across different breeds. Different breed associations have different calculations to calculate those EPDs. Um, so EPDs are based on individual, uh, their individual performance, the relatives, and the progeny. Um, so I'm going to show you a few things of what, um, so there's three things to look at when you're looking at EPDs. So I've got a screenshot of some EPDs at the bottom there. Um, and you see there's three numbers under each of the EPDs. So the top one is the actual EPD number. So that's the actual calculation number for that predictor. The second line, the middle line of numbers is the accuracy. So how accurate is that prediction? Um, and then the bottom one is the percentile rate. So where does that EPD for that animal compared to the entire herd book for that. So all of the registered animals within that breed, where does this animal's EPDs fit on that ranking? So I'll go into each of those in a little bit more detail. So expected progeny difference. So difference being highlighted here. So when you're comparing the EPDs on two animals, so here we're looking at the weaning weight EPD. Um, so bull A has a plus 30 and bull B has a plus 10. So when comparing those two, the difference between them is 20 pounds. So the potential progeny of bull A will have a approximately 20 pound heavier weaning weight than the progeny off of bull B. Um, so that's where EPDs can help you pick between two different bulls or you know, comparing a specific trait between two animals um, within the same breed is, is where you can use EPDs. So next would be accuracies. So that middle line. Um, so accuracy, EPDs are calculated based on the, their heritage. So their dam and sires, EPDs, when, and then their own performance data gets put into that as well as any progeny. So once that bull has progeny registered in the herd book, that will impact the EPD calculations as well. So this top, this top set of EPDs is a yearling bull with no registered progeny. So you can see the accuracy is around that 36, 40% um, or lower. And you can tell which traits are more heritable than others because some of them um, are fairly low accuracy um, as well. So then the middle one is a mature bull that has 25 registered progeny in the herd book. 
um, and the accuracies have increased um, a bit. So more around that 50% accurate um, on some of them. And then the bottom one is a mature bull that has 1,350 registered progeny. So this bull was an AI sire um, that has many, many progeny registered and performance data inputted. And you can see how the accuracy significantly jump up to that 90% accurate. So when, if you're using um, AI bulls and you know can select from multiple ones, the more progeny registered off them, the more accurate those EPDs are could be and the more weight you could put on using them as, as a tool. Um, on yearling bulls at bull sale season, EPDs are a predictor and a general, general um, give you a general idea of the genetic potential of that bull, but the accuracies are relatively low. So it's just a tool. I wouldn't suggest buying a bull based solely on EPDs um, for that reason, that, that the accuracy and the, the data to go into them um, isn't proven yet um, versus an AI bull where you can, you can select a bull um, on those EPDs a lot more heavily. And then the last part to look at with EPDs is the percentile rank. So that bottom number shows where that EPD for that animal ranks against all other animals in that breed. Um, so you can see anything in the green for those EPDs is above the breed average and anything in blue is below the breed average. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea where that animal stands um, in the, in, within that breed. Um, the last one of the last things I'm going to um, talk about. So those are some of the tools that you can use to buy uh, buy bulls and select or select bulls when you're looking at catalogs and that sort of thing. Um, when you go to buy a bull, have confidence in the program you bull, buy bulls from. Um, take a look at the cows that those bulls come from um, and, and the, the, the cow, how the cow herds manage of where you're buying those bulls. Um, you know, when we buy a bull, we want to see pictures of, of the dam, the mother, what has she done for that program? Um, I think, you know, going back and, and seeing where those bulls come from and what kind of cow family they come from says a lot about the potential for that to work. Um, different insurance and warranty programs, if you're buying from and spending good money on a bull, um, is that breeder or a bull uh, gonna, Gonna, gonna support you um, and what kind of warranty and, and insurance do they have. Um, temperament, uh, get, see the bull, what is he like? Temperament um, is, is a big thing, not only on the bull itself, but in the cow herd in general um, as well is, is something um, I, always encourage guys to come to the farm, take a look at the bulls, we can look at the cows um, and, and really do your homework on, on the bulls that you're selecting. So a few take home notes um, to wrap up. Uh, one would be avoid single trait selection. So I talked about lots of different traits and uh, different tools that can help you select those traits depending what your goals are. Um, avoiding single trait, single trait selection is important. Um, you know, buying a Cavianese specialist bull on, and then another Cavianese bull, and then another Cavianese bull, and using that Cavianese on Cavianese on Cavianese year after year will get you into an extreme, <laughs> extremely uh, low birth weight uh, situation. Um, and this is one of my favorite memes as well. Um, seeing this little, little tiny calf. Um, I think we may have taken this low birth weight heifer bull idea a little too far this time. Um, so when you're setting your goals and looking at your cow herd, determining what type of traits you need out of your herd bull, um, making sure that your herd bull selection complements what your cow herd can do and what your ultimate progeny is going to look like. Uh, the better the data col you collect, the more informed decisions you can make. Um, so little improvements over time can, can um, equate to better making better decisions. So try keeping um, records, uh, weight records, all sorts of whatever traits you're looking for, track it for a few, a year or two and, and see if that is something that you need to put. Um, know if your herd bulls are still sound prior to bull sale season. So when bull sale season starts to ramp up, 
um, that's maybe a good time just to check in on your bulls, especially if you got some older herd sires that you're unsure if they're going to make another breeding Stop season. Um, and have your pick made prior to bull sale time. So we all get lots of bull sale catalogs. Um, so do some flipping through, pick up, make some picks, um, go check out the bulls ahead of time, um, at sale day or ahead of sale time. Um, try not to buy, a, pick the bull as they come through the ring um, without doing your homework. Uh, I think ultimately you'll be most happy with the bulls that you do your homework and, and, and take, take a closer look at ahead of time. Um, a lot of bull sales nowadays are video sales. So being able to pick a bull as they come through the ring isn't always an opportunity anymore either. Um, so make sure you have your homework done ahead of time. And that wraps up um, my presentation. So if there are any questions, please let me know. Thanks, Andrea. Is there a EPD or do many of the purebred producers have the gestation length on the bulls? Because I know that's one of the factors for calving ease. If you have a bull that's got a shorter gestation length. Yeah, so the breed associations don't have an EPD for gestation that I know of. Um, but you can always look into the, that breed association um, on the website. All the herd book is online. So you can search an animal's EPD and performance data um, within that breed association website and find all of that. Um, but some producers do print gestation length in their, in their catalogs. Um, I know I have seen that before um, where, you know, a lot of the seed stock producers, they do know exact breeding dates on their animals um, and then can calculate out what the actual gestation was on that bull. Um, so that is something that if, if the producer does track that, um, and I have seen it printed in some books, it's not a standard, I would say. Um, but if it's something you're interested in, definitely ask the breeder that's, you know, the bulls that you're looking at, because um, they might be able to figure it out for any particular bull that you're, you're looking at. Yeah, because you can get a shorter gestation bull and you could still have some pretty growthy genetics and, and be productive, but you're, you're not giving up that production just for the calving side. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it is a tool that you could definitely help to make that decision. Uh, one thing I've noticed in some of the, the full catalogs of late is there's so much straw in the pictures that you know that the bull's not going to have any frost damage to his privates because uh, he's up to his belly and straw, but you can't see his feet. You can hardly see his legs. And, and it, yeah. why, why can't those pictures be taken on flat, hard ground? I, I understand the reason they're trying to make that bull look thicker, but you can't yeah. see his legs and you're doing a disservice to yeah. sell, selling those animals. So for pictures of bulls, um, I think there's a happy medium. Uh, to straw up to their bellies, it doesn't do any good for any, any part of the picture. Um, having a nice amount of straw gives the animal a more, a better, um, uh, what's, a more proportionate look. Um, and nowadays with video and that sort of thing, there is, um, you can see a lot more structural soundness if you go and see the video of the animal or go see the animal in real life. Um, picture is a good way to, you know, get that first impression of a bull, but I would never buy a bull just from the picture. Um, if that picture catches my attention and sparks my interest and, hey, I think I like that bull, then go and take a closer look. Either go see that bull where you can see him on flat unstrawed ground and take a close look at the feet and legs um, or ask the producer for pictures of the feet and legs. I know we get that a lot. Um, we spend a lot of time going around taking, you know, a zoomed in picture of the front feet on this bull or, you know, his mother, um, the cow family's feet and legs, that sort of thing too. So um, mm -hmm. the yeah. picture, the picture is, is a good way to, you know, pick which bulls catch your attention and then make sure you take a closer look at the other attributes. Yeah, definitely. And maybe maybe there should be some pictures zoomed in on the feet and legs in the bull catalogs. Because Yeah, and, and some some do that. I, ha I have seen some producers that do that, do kind of insert pictures of zoomed in pictures, um, not on all the bulls maybe, but on, on some of them they do for sure. Okay, no, that's good to know. Any other questions for Andrea, Pam? Did you have any? Or? No, sorry, there are none, Sean. All right, well, thank you both to uh, Andrea and Deanne for their informative presentations.
and for joining us on Stock Talk. Uh, can you see my screen with the Stock Talk agenda? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, okay good. Just want to make sure it was being shared because it's happened in the past where it wasn't. So just like to mention, our next webinar will be on April 13th on forage and pasture management. So we will have a presentation on grazing management using precipitation calculations for stocking de decisions. And then we'll look at annual forages for feed as well as some pasture management tips. Uh, last month, I showed a slide on the livestock price insurance program and the top price that you could get for calves last month was 292 at a premium of 703 for an end of September um, period or uh, 292 for a premium of 781 for the end of October. Now those prices have, have jumped considerably just like with our calves that we're selling through the ring. So now the top insured price that you can uh, lock in for is 316. So at a six weight, that's $1,896 for that end of September period. And that comes with a premium of 779. If you look at a little bit further down, you can lock in $3 uh, for a premium of 410 for the end of September or a premium of 523 for October. So there's some really good coverage levels there. Of course, that's not a guaranteed price. That's the, the, the representative price of what uh, the cattle are selling for during that time frame. So keep an eye on, on the insurance available. You can uh, lock in prices up until June. And then anyone who's been tracking snowfall this winter, um, it's significantly down from beginning of November till uh, this week. We are sitting at below 50% for much of Southern Manitoba. Only the Northwest has, has closer to normal, but still in that 70 to 60% range for, for precipitation. So, so we're having a drier winter, whether that's gonna lead into a drier spring and, and a drier growing season, only time will tell. But uh, you may wanna look at what insurance is available, especially on the forage side. This is some coverage available in Eastern Interlake for forage region six under the select hay insurance program for alfalfa fields less than four years of age, you can get dollar coverage of 385 per acre at a cost of just over $28 an acre in premium. If you look at fields older than four years old, you can get coverage at 275. And then if you have alfalfa grass mixture fields, the younger fields, you get, get coverage at 275 for a premium of just under $18. So some pretty good coverage there for, for reasonable premiums. And you got to keep in mind that that includes the hay disaster benefit and forage restoration in, in these insurance programs. And then a more basic type of insurance is the basic hay at a lower cost, which covers all your forages. Deadline to apply is end of March for an agri insurance contract, whether that's for forage insurance or for hail insurance. So contact your local MESC office if you want to sign up or make changes to the crops that you have insured. We have a number of specialists across the province, Pam's in Dauphin, Cindy's in Arburg, Elizabeth and Roblin, myself in Portage, Andrew's in Clarny, and Kristen is in Beauxjardins. And if you're needing any calving books, Seed Manitoba, Forge Adaptation, Cost Production, or other fact sheets, just contact one of our offices. And we do have 10 MESC and Ag Service Centers across the province that you can stop in and pick up some of those resources. I just wanted to show you one of the websites with a lot of valuable information is the Beef Cattle Research Council. They have a number of tips on calving and calf management. And so feel free to check out some of those resources. I just heard on the radio this morning on CGOB, a producer up at Winnipegosis had his second set of triplets in the last three years and from the same cow. So that's phenomenal. We're hearing a lot, a lot more twins being born this year, but also a lot more heifers. So it's sounding like a, a positive calving season so far, other than guys that are wanting to sell bulls or, or steers, which are worth more, uh, they're getting more, more heifers. So that concludes today's stock talk. I'd like to thank you for joining and hope to see you on April the 13th for our final stock talk of the season. <laughs>